chapter eight of abraham lincoln a history volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay chapter eight cameron and stanton when the men of the south plotted secession and declared war to perpetuate and extend slavery they little dreamed what a sure and relentless agency for its destruction they set in motion it has been related how hostilities opened with butler's offer to suppress a slave rising in maryland and how from some of the earlier camps fugitives were returned to their owners also how in a few months the practice of the army changed to giving them wholesale shelter and employment and to enforcing the confiscation act of congress which broke the legal bondage of those whom the rebels employed in hostile military service the unavoidable processes of war soon moved the question forward another step if the army undertook to employ negroes in military work at exposed points must it not protect them and as a necessary consequence must it not permit them to protect themselves and furnish them weapons for defence this question became important when the sea-coast expeditions were organized particularly in the one destined for port royal where a district with a largely predominant slave population was to be attacked friendly blacks in great numbers would be sure to flock to the union lines and the climate being extremely unhealthy for northern troops it was desirable to employ them for labor and fatigue duty whenever possible the government could not do otherwise than give the commander permission to use every military advantage which might present itself in drawing up instructions on this point the assistant secretary of war after referring to prior orders continued special directions adapted to special circumstances cannot be given much must be referred to your own discretion as commanding general of the expedition you will however in general avail yourself of the services of any persons whether fugitives from labor or not who may offer them to the national government you will employ such persons in such service as they may be fitted for either as ordinary employees or if special circumstances seem to require it in any other capacity with such organization in squads companies or otherwise as you may deem most beneficial to the service when this instruction was read to president lincoln he foresaw that the latitude it gave might cause a terrible outcry of malicious criticism and he therefore interlined with his own hand the following qualifying sentence this however not to mean a general arming of them for military service if any political design lay hidden within the original phraseology of the instruction as it came from the war department it escaped notice or comment because it represented the actual requirements of the moment in all save the cautionary limit which mr lincoln's amendment supplied his own prudence in dealing with the slavery question was however not imitated by all those about him the fremont incident sharply marked the rapid drift and development of public opinion on this sensitive topic and men were becoming either more conservative or more progressive according to their several convictions it was not unnatural that political leaders should begin to trim their sails to this fresh breeze of popular sentiment and before long it furnished an occurrence out of which grew the first change in president lincoln's cabinet in preparing to transmit to congress at its december session the customary official documents which accompany the president's message mr lincoln found to his surprise that the annual report of the secretary of war 
had been printed and without being submitted to his inspection mailed to the postmasters of the chief cities to be handed to the press as soon as the telegraph should announce that the reading of the message was completed in congress when a copy came to his hands the reason for this haste was quite apparent in its closing paragraph secretary cameron's report took distinct ground in favor of arming the negroes and incorporating them in the military service referring to the slaves abandoned by their owners in the territory captured by the port royal expedition the report said those who make war against the government justly forfeit all rights of property privilege or security derived from the constitution and laws against which they are in armed rebellion and as the labor and service of their slaves constitute the chief property of the rebels such property should share the common fate of war to which they have devoted the property of loyal citizens it is as clearly a right of the government to arm slaves when it may become necessary as it is to use gunpowder taken from the enemy whether it is expedient to do so is purely a military question what to do with that species of property is a question that time and circumstance will solve and need not be anticipated further than to repeat that they cannot be held by the government as slaves it would be useless to keep them as prisoners of war and self-preservation the highest duty of a government or of individuals demands that they should be disposed of or employed in the most effective manner that will tend most speedily to suppress the insurrection and restore the authority of the government if it shall be found that the men who have been held by the rebels as slaves are capable of bearing arms and performing efficient military service it is the right and may become the duty of the government to arm and equip them and employ their services against the rebels under proper military regulation discipline and command while mr lincoln agreed perfectly with the secretary of war in the abstract right of the government to use abandoned or fugitive negroes in any military capacity he did not think the time had arrived for forming them into marching regiments neither did he deem it expedient that an official declaration of such a purpose should be published by a prominent officer of his administration the pamphlet copies of the report were still in the leading post offices these were hastily recalled by telegraph and secretary cameron printed a new edition modified according to the president's direction by omitting all that portion of the argument relating to the controverted question and in its place inserting a short paragraph to the effect that the slaves on captured or abandoned plantations should not be returned to their masters but withheld to lessen the enemy's military resources ordinarily so radical a difference in administrative policy the abrupt manner of its promulgation and the peremptory recall and modification of a secretary's report would scarcely fail to cause a disagreeable cabinet explosion lincoln's uniform good nature and considerate forbearance however enabled him to endure and manage the incident without a quarrel or even the least manifestation of ill-will on either side having corrected his minister's haste and imprudence the president indulged in no further comment and cameron yielding to superior authority received the implied rebuke with becoming grace from the confidential talks with his intimates it was clear enough that he expected a dismissal but lincoln never acted in a harsh or arbitrary mood for the time being the personal relations between the president and his secretary of war remained unchanged they met in cabinet consultations or for the daily dispatch of routine business with the same cordial ease as before nevertheless each of them realized that the circumstance had created a situation of difficulty and embarrassment which could not be indefinitely prolonged cameron began to signify his weariness of the onerous labors of the war department and hinted to the president that he would greatly prefer the less responsible duties of a foreign mission 
lincoln said nothing for several weeks but he was waiting for a favorable moment when he might make a cabinet change with the least official friction or public attention to outsiders the affair seemed to have completely blown over when on january eleventh eighteen sixty two lincoln wrote the following short note my dear sir as you have more than once expressed a desire for a change of position i can now gratify you consistently with my view of the public interest i therefore propose nominating you to the senate next monday as minister to russia very sincerely your friend a lincoln there is an interesting passage in the published diary of secretary chase informing us that this note written on saturday was shown by cameron on sunday afternoon to secretary seward and chase also implying that several separate and joint interviews had been going on between these three cabinet ministers for a day or two previous in which they discussed the question of cameron's retirement his nomination to russia and the equally important topic of who should become his successor in the war department three points seem evident from the record that while they all had a hint of the change neither of them knew definitely whether it would be finally made or when it would occur or who would be called to fill the vacancy chase laments that seward might suspect him of not dealing frankly seward is represented as appearing to know more than he communicated and cameron as hesitating between no and yes they finally all joined in the opinion that the most agreeable and the fittest successor in the war department would be stanton and if we may trust the language of the diary each of them was impressed with the belief that he alone was the chief agency in bringing about the change in delicately causing its hearty acceptance and especially in selecting the man destined to become the greatest war minister the government has ever had the truth was that a stronger will and a yet more delicate tact had inspired and guided them all lincoln securing his main purpose of once more combining these three influential leaders in renewed support of his administration in the midst of a cabinet crisis changing rupture into strength and discord into harmony was quite content to allow them to appropriate the merit of the success on the following day the new nominations went to the senate where they were speedily confirmed nearly a month elapsed before the usual perfunctory and ex post facto correspondence was published in the newspapers wherein the incident was recited in more formal phraseology it is proper to mention in this connection that the cabinet change here described caused no change in the friendship between lincoln and cameron three or four months afterwards a violent factional assault upon the latter in the house of representatives resulted in the passage of a resolution of censure charging cameron while secretary of war with having adopted in certain transactions a policy highly injurious to the public service as soon as mr lincoln's attention was called to the resolution he wrote and transmitted to the house a special message explaining that the censured transactions occurred during the days of the first and extreme peril of the government when washington was cut off from communication with the north by the insurrection in maryland that the acts complained of were not done by cameron exclusively but were ordered by the president with the full assent of his cabinet every member of which with himself was equally responsible for the alleged irregularity cameron gratefully remembered this voluntary and manly defence of his official integrity he remained one of the most intimate and devoted of lincoln's personal friends and became one of the earliest and most effective advocates of his renomination and re-election to the presidency edwin m stanton the new secretary of war who became at once a prominent and powerful figure in the government was born in steubenville ohio december nineteenth eighteen fourteen 
he was educated at kenyon college and began the practice of law in eighteen thirty six by ten years of studious industry he acquired the skill and rank in his profession which justified his removal in eighteen forty seven to the great commercial and manufacturing city of pittsburgh from this point he was entrusted with a class of cases which took him so frequently before the supreme court of the united states that in eighteen fifty six he permanently established his office in washington city being an ardent democrat in politics and both the president and attorney general of the united states being at that time citizens of pennsylvania his local influence and acquaintance probably secured his employment as counsel for the government in certain important land cases in california during the year eighteen fifty eight this employment necessarily brought him into confidential relations with the department of justice and the attorney general that his services proved valuable and satisfactory is shown by the double fact that president buchanan consulted him in the preparation of his annual message and on the retirement of cass from his cabinet about the middle of december eighteen sixty appointed him attorney-general to succeed judge black who was made secretary of state there is a conflict of evidence as to stanton's precise attitude in this new relation ex-secretary black has written that he fully adopted the non-coercion views of his black's official opinion of november twenty and of buchanan's annual message formulating the doctrine of non-coercion also that he read and endorsed buchanan's special message of january eighth eighteen sixty one which was a virtual abdication of executive functions but black's own opinions and position between these dates are palpably inconsistent and antagonistic witness his written memorandum given to the president in the new cabinet crisis of december thirty advising a certain course and explaining this is coercion black further explains that stanton copied the memorandum and freely joined in the advice buchanan's cabinet was undergoing a revolutionary convulsion black was evidently steering between opposing factions till the president called him to lead the union section and sentiment of his cabinet when he for the first time took positive and consistent ground his own version of these transactions may be pardoned for representing himself as the directing leader in this partial transformation of buchanan's administration those who were familiar with the characters of the two men will rather conclude that stanton's positive nature and impulsive energy were the real sources of the decided stand which black then for the first time assumed the same revolutionary dangers and apprehensions explain another apparent impossibility there is direct and indirect testimony from prominent republican leaders seward wilson sumner dawes howard and perhaps others that during this period stanton a stubborn and prejudiced buchanan democrat was in secret communication and concert with those leading spirits of the opposition black who ten years afterwards wrote a bitterly partisan article questioning the facts asks did he stanton accept the confidence of the president buchanan and the cabinet with a predetermined intent to betray it and calls such conduct conspiring with abolitionists the simple truth appears to be that stanton becoming a member of buchanan's cabinet with no suspicion of the conspiracy by which jefferson davis and secretaries cobb floyd and thompson ensnared and for the moment controlled it was horrified at the revelation which his new duties opened to him seeing president buchanan in an attitude of hopeless irresolution amid a preponderance of treasonable advice he entered into secret relations with the republican leaders and disclosed the facts as the only available rock of safety in the stress and peril of impending revolution several years before stanton had met the new president under peculiar circumstances it happened that mr lincoln mr stanton and george harding were associated as counsel in a celebrated reaper patent case which was tried in the city of cincinnati before the united states circuit court though they had not met in consultation prior to the trial 
it is related on the one hand that lincoln was senior counsel and that when the hearing came on stanton undervaluing lincoln's character and ability with unprofessional assurance grasped the role of making the argument on the law points to which as junior counsel he had no claim under the custom of the bar that as the court would hear only two lawyers on a side and as the review of the mechanical questions was specially confided to mr harding this arrangement deprived mr lincoln and to his disappointment of the opportunity of speaking before a prominent court and a new and distinguished auditory on the other hand we are distinctly informed by one of the clients in that suit that mr lincoln was the junior counsel and mr stanton and mr harding had made so much longer and more elaborate preparation that the clients themselves determined their selection to make the arguments that therefore mr lincoln's displacement arose from no unfairness of any one but simply from the fact that the court had limited the number of speakers when the new president was inaugurated stanton and the other members of buchanan's administration went into sudden eclipse for months the public heard nothing from them and in the mighty rush of events thought nothing about them they evidently felt keenly the popular odium under which they disappeared for the moment and were eager to magnify in their own extenuation every real or apparent shortcoming of their successors in a series of confidential letters which did not become public till years after the war from which we have elsewhere made quotations we have an interesting record of stanton's views and feelings he watched the beginnings of the new administration with an eye of unsparing fault-finding it is clear that he had no high opinion of mr lincoln and no hope in the republican party worse than all his faith in the ability of the government to defend and maintain itself seems to have been seriously shaken if not utterly gone his comments on public events are couched in a tone of partisan bitterness he thought mr douglas's senate resolution a comprehensive platform for relinquishing everything in the seceded states he predicted that by the time that all the patronage is distributed the republican party will be dissolved he reported the impression that in less than thirty days davis will be in possession of washington he repeated baseless street rumors of the trepidation of lincoln and the panic of the administration complained of party action venality and corruption of power and distrust in every department of the government as events culminated his language grew stronger he spoke of the painful imbecility of lincoln with all the glibness of a country editor and after the bull run defeat he thought a better state of things impossible until jefferson davis turns out the whole concern it would be uncharitable to insist on a literal criticism of these phrases they must be judged in the light of stanton's excited patriotism and impulsive vehemence of thought also it must be remembered that they were written for confidential not public inspection and more than all that he wrote them without the full and accurate knowledge which was requisite to a proper judgment he is certainly to be blamed for the harshness of his language and the recklessness of such assertions on the strength of street rumours but making allowance for the party prejudice and official soreness which inspired them they assist in our interpretation of the larger capabilities and future usefulness of the man under the domination and control of that unsleeping prudence and large-hearted charity which characterized president lincoln who was able to transmute such a mine of energy to continuous regulated public service at a high pressure and yet hold its excesses in check temper its harshness and ease its inevitable friction stanton's nature was largely materialistic his eye saw things in a simple practical light his mind dealt with them by rules of arithmetic his knowledge of legal principles was governed by the same characteristic hence his success in questions dealing with physical facts land cases and especially patent cases involving the examination of mechanical forces 
this quality arising mainly from strong instinctive perception was coupled with another trait which gave it extraordinary power and value namely physical and mental energy above everything else he was a man of action what in other men might be likened to the variable force of winds or wills might be represented in him as the continuous unremitting action of a steam engine able to furnish at every call any required pressure and speed for any period of duration he had thus the qualities which made him a worker of workers method and organization were with him prime intuitions he was impatient of delay and intolerant of neglect every thought and volition was positive he was positive in his personal friendships positive in his party convictions positive in his judgments positive to the last degree in his expressions yet these fundamental qualities were somewhat modified and restrained by his education and experience in his profession he had learned the uncertainties of the law in politics he had witnessed the suddenness of popular transition and the faithlessness of individuals to obligations of party and principle his cabinet experience had shown him how the apparently solid pillars of state might be undermined by concealed disaffection and treason his judgment therefore tempered his instincts and restrained his impulses it was doubtless this which made it possible for him to surrender sufficiently his party prejudices while yet a member of buchanan's cabinet to confide in and advise with republican leaders and later to accept a cabinet office from lincoln towards whom he had used such severe and unjust language in a letter to mr buchanan dated march one eighteen sixty two he says my accession to my present position was quite as sudden and unexpected as the confidence you bestowed upon me in calling me to your cabinet and the responsible trust was accepted in both instances from the same motives and will be executed with the same fidelity to the constitution and laws in another letter dated may eighteenth eighteen sixty two he wrote i hold my present post at the request of the president who knew me personally but to whom i had not spoken from the fourth of march eighteen sixty one until the day he handed me my commission i knew that everything i cherish and hold dear would be sacrificed by accepting office but i thought i might help to save the country and for that i was willing to perish and six months later he again wrote in respect to the present position of affairs all i can say is that the whole power of the government is being put forth with more vigor and i think more earnestness on the part of military commanders than at any former period treason is encouraged in the northern states by the just discontent of the people but believing our national destiny is as immediately in the hands of the most high as ever was that of the children of israel i am not only undismayed but full of hope for myself turning neither to the right hand nor to the left serving no man and at enmity with none i shall strive to perform my whole duty in the great work before us mistakes and faults i no doubt may commit but the purpose of my actions shall be single to the public good these extracts evidently present a true statement of stanton's feeling he accepted his appointment in both instances not as a party or official retainer but as a call to a citizen's duty and in both cases he sought to make his service consistent not with party profession but with patriotic obligation fidelity to the constitution and laws required him under buchanan to do everything in his power to thwart the conspiracy in which his colleagues cobb thompson and floyd were engaged and the same principle bound him under lincoln to use every agency he could control to suppress rebellion and re-establish the national authority in this mood he began his duties as lincoln's war secretary and in a daily official intercourse of more than three years rendered his great chief a steady personal service and devotion of which he probably little dreamed when in the summer of eighteen sixty one he was so ignorantly writing of the painful imbecility of lincoln now he could better measure the president's intellectual strength and observe his unselfish patriotism 
neither of the men had an easy task to perform it was a relation calculated to curb any light promptings of vanity or self-sufficiency and for his own immense responsibilities the secretary of war had frequent need of the indulgence of the executive from first to last there was between them substantial unity of aim cooperation in effort confidence in word and act stanton joined heartily in all the great military and political measures of the administration ample calls for troops liberal bounties the desire for vigorous offensive campaigns promotion for merit emancipation the draft the organization and protection of colored troops and the amendment of the constitution to abolish slavery his advice was always intelligent consistent and steady his decisions were rapid and generally judicious and permanent in cabinet discussions he was forcible rather than brilliant ready with fact and law and though not dogmatic always decided as natural with two strong minds they sometimes differed in their estimates of men or advisability of measures but never in principle or object the relation of mr lincoln to the members of his cabinet was one of unusual frankness and cordiality the president was gifted by nature with a courtesy far excelling the conventionalities of an acquired politeness with a delicacy which has rarely been equalled he respected not merely their official authority but also their sentiments their judgments their manhood though differing widely from him in personal qualities they returned his courtesy and kindness as a rule with warm friendship and none of them more sincerely than mr stanton the president found support in the outspoken counsel and robust energy of his war minister the secretary yielded trustfully to the superior sagacity and authority of the president lincoln began by giving his new secretary that full discretion which his selection properly implied and which the vast and responsible duties expected of him unavoidably demanded it may safely be asserted that stanton employed this trust with high patriotic aspiration in comparison with the general correctness of his judgment and the value of his advice and action his few mistakes which might be pointed out become trivial the occasional exhibitions of temper and brusqueness of manner which have been observed in him are chargeable to the harassing perplexity of his duties naturally he was genial and kind and his words often evinced a deep tenderness of feeling as he did not spare his own health and strength in the public service by day or by night so he required from every subordinate whether a general or a private whether in washington or in the farthest camp unremitting activity devotion sacrifice both the war department and the army instantly felt the quickening influence of his rare organizing power combined with a will which nothing but unquestioning obedience would satisfy he insisted rigidly upon military system discipline and duty there was indeed urgent need for their enforcement the hundreds of thousands of civilians suddenly called to arms as soldiers or officers did not take kindly to the subordination and restraints of the camp the flood of promotions which attended the organization of brigades and divisions produced an unhealthy rivalry in all grades of command showering congress the war department and the executive mansion with applications the evil of officers furloughs to come to washington to further their promotions became so great as to excite the wit of the newspapers the other day ran a paragraph a boy threw a stone at a dog on pennsylvania avenue and hit three brigadier generals stanton took hold of such abuses with an energetic hand he banished self-seeking shoulder straps from the capital he centred the telegraph in the war department where the publication of military news which might prematurely reach the enemy could be supervised and if necessary delayed he expanded and vivified his various military bureaus he found some congressmen like some contractors misrepresenting his peremptory refusals of the special favors they arrogantly demanded 
to correct this abuse he for a period stood every day at a stated hour beside a tall desk in one of the rooms of the war department where he compelled each applicant or interviewer high or low to state his request publicly and audibly in presence of the assembled throng so that the stenographer at his elbow could record it as well as the secretary's answer and verbal solicitations and personal interviews diminished suddenly under this staring publicity it was stanton's habit to go personally with news or official papers to the executive mansion informally at all hours it was lincoln's practice to go as informally to stanton's office at the war department and in times of great suspense during impending or actual battles to spend hour after hour with his war secretary where he could read the telegrams as fast as they were received and handed in from the adjoining room under such conditions there grew up between them an intimacy in which the mind and heart of each were given without reserve to the great work in which they bore such conspicuous parts when the time for mr lincoln's re-election came no man desired or laboured for it more earnestly than edwin m stanton while no one appreciated more clearly or valued more highly than president lincoln the splendid abilities and services of his secretary of war the anecdotes of his occasional blunt disregard of the president's expressed wishes are either untrue or are half-truths that lead to erroneous conclusions and originated probably in a certain roughness of stanton's manner under strong irritation lincoln never magnified trifles stanton seldom neglected a plain duty nevertheless in the multifarious details of their daily labors they sometimes found each other at cross purpose in regard to some minor and relatively unimportant matter stanton carrying out the great operations of the war department in which system and order were essential was predisposed to insist upon adherence to established rules lincoln on the other hand governing the greater machine of administration which included the temper and drift of public opinion equally with the rules and articles of war was by nature as well as by reason constantly moved not merely to the pardoning power with which he was specially invested by the constitution but also to that unwritten dispensing authority enfolded within the broad scope of executive discretion and was prone to temper the harsh accidents of civil war by a generous and liberal construction of law and duty it is quite possible that stanton thought the president too ready to yield to the hundreds of personal petitions which besieged him for clemency or relief and we have the written evidence that in the following case at least though we believe the authentic instances are rare the president's written direction was neglected by his secretary until reminded of his proper duty by this note from mr lincoln a poor widow by the name of baird has a son in the army that for some offence has been sentenced to serve a long time without pay or at most with very little pay i do not like this punishment of withholding pay it falls so very hard upon poor families after he had been serving in this way for several months at the tearful appeal of the poor mother i made a direction that he be allowed to enlist for a new term on the same conditions as others she now comes and says she cannot get it acted upon please do it stanton had his warm-hearted as well as his hot-tempered and stubborn moods and it is not likely after this patient explanation that he hesitated an instant to carry out the president's request the strong will of stanton met in lincoln a still stronger personality which governed not merely by higher legal authority but by the manifestation of a greater soul and a clearer insight justifying his decisions with a convincing logic to show how effectively and yet how prudently the president wielded this weapon we quote another letter written by him upon a kindred class of topics i am so pressed in regard to prisoners of war in our custody whose homes are within our lines and who wish to not be exchanged but to take the oath and be discharged that i hope you will pardon me for again calling up the subject my impression is that we will not ever force the exchange of any of this class that taking the oath and being discharged none of them will again go to the rebellion but the rebellion again coming to them a considerable percentage of them probably not a majority would rejoin it 
that by a cautious discrimination the number so discharged would not be large enough to do any considerable mischief in any event would relieve distress in at least some meritorious cases and would give me some relief from an intolerable pressure i shall be glad therefore to have your cheerful assent to the discharge of those whose names i may send which i will only do with circumspection in answer to the above letter stanton on the next day wrote mr president your order for the discharge of any prisoners of war will be cheerfully and promptly obeyed as lincoln thus always treated stanton not as a department clerk but with the respect and consideration due a cabinet minister questions of difference rarely came to a head there were very few instances in which they ever became sufficiently defined to leave a written record one such was when the president ordered franklin's division to join mcclellan against stanton's desire that it should be kept with mcdowell's army moving by land to cover washington another when stanton with several other members of the cabinet signed a protest against mcclellan's being placed in command of the army of the potomac after pope's defeat in virginia in this instance these cabinet signers had the good sense not to send their protest to mr lincoln still a third when stanton made an order giving bishop ames control of the methodist churches which had fallen into our hands in the south in plain violation of a prior letter from the president that the government must not undertake to run the churches in these and similar cases stanton yielded readily one authentic case remains where the trial of will between the two men was brought to the point of a sharper issue it is related by general james b fry who witnessed the scene its beginning is sufficiently stated in the following order made by lincoln on september one eighteen sixty four it is represented to me that there are at rock island illinois as rebel prisoners of war many persons of northern and foreign birth who are unwilling to be exchanged and sent south but who wish to take the oath of allegiance and enter the military service of the union colonel hudicoper on behalf of the people of some parts of pennsylvania wishes to pay the bounties the government would have to pay to proper persons of this class have them enter the service of the united states and be credited to the localities furnishing the bounty money he will therefore proceed to rock island ascertain the names of such persons not including any who have attractions southward and telegraph them to the provost marshal general here whereupon direction will be given to discharge the persons named upon their taking the oath of allegiance and upon the official evidence being furnished that they shall have been duly received and mustered into the service of the united states their number will be credited as may be directed by colonel hudicoper from what followed we may be certain that the president did not understand the full scope and effect of the order and when stanton learned all the circumstances he refused to carry it out and upon lincoln's reiterating it refused a second time general fry who was the provost marshal general having special charge of such questions thus continues his narrative then lincoln went in person to stanton's office and i was called there by the latter to state the facts in the case i reported to the two high officials as i had previously done to the secretary alone that these men already belonged to the united states being prisoners of war that they could not be used against the confederates that they had no relation whatever to the county to which it was proposed they should be credited that all that was necessary towards enlisting them in our army for indian service was the government's release of them as prisoners of war that to give them bounty and credit them to a county which owed some of its own men for service against the confederates would waste money and deprive the army operating against a powerful enemy of that number of men etc stanton said now mr president those are the facts and you must see that your order cannot be executed lincoln sat upon a sofa with his legs crossed and did not say a word until the secretary's last remark then he said in a somewhat positive tone mr secretary i reckon you'll have to execute the order stanton replied with asperity mr president i cannot do it the order is an improper one and i cannot execute it lincoln fixed his eye upon stanton and in a firm voice and with an accent that clearly showed his determination he said mr secretary it will have to be done 
stanton then realized that he was overmatched he had made a square issue with the president and been defeated notwithstanding the fact that he was in the right upon an intimation from him i withdrew and did not witness his surrender a few minutes after i reached my office i received instructions from the secretary to carry out the president's order it must not be assumed from the termination of the above incident that mr lincoln wished either to humiliate the secretary of war or compel him to violate his convictions of duty in the interim between general fry's withdrawal from the room and the secretary's acquiescence lincoln had doubtless explained to stanton with that irresistible frankness and kindness with which he carried all his points of controversy the reasons for his insistence which he immediately further put upon record for the secretary's justification in the following letter to general grant dated september twenty two eighteen sixty four i send this as an explanation to you and to do justice to the secretary of war i was induced upon pressing applications to authorize agents of one of the districts of pennsylvania to recruit in one of the prison depots in illinois and the thing went so far before it came to the knowledge of the secretary that in my judgment it could not be abandoned without greater evil than would follow its going through i did not know at the time that you had protested against that class of thing being done and i now say that while this particular job must be completed no other of the sort will be authorized without an understanding with you if at all the secretary of war is wholly free of any part in this blunder End of chapter eight chapter nine of abraham lincoln a history volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay chapter nine plans of campaign about the first of december eighteen sixty one mr lincoln who saw more clearly than mcclellan then general-in-chief the urgent necessity for some movement of the army suggested to him a plan of campaign which afterwards much debated and discussed and finally rejected is now seen to have been eminently wise and sagacious he made a brief autograph memorandum of his plan which he handed to mcclellan who kept it for ten days and returned it to mr lincoln with a hurried memorandum in pencil showing that it made little impression on his mind the memorandum and answer are so illustrative of the two men that we give them here in full copied from the original manuscript if it were determined to make a forward movement of the army of the potomac without awaiting further increase of numbers or better drill and discipline how long would it require to actually get in motion answer in pencil if bridge trains ready by december fifteenth probably twenty fifth after leaving all that would be necessary how many troops could join the movement from southwest of the river in pencil seventy one thousand how many from northeast of it in pencil thirty three thousand suppose then that of those southwest of the river in pencil fifty thousand move forward and menace the enemy at centreville the remainder of the movable force on that side move rapidly to the crossing of the ococquin by the road from alexandria towards richmond there to be joined by the whole movable force from northeast of the river having landed from the potomac just below the mouth of the ococquan moved by land up the south side of that stream to the crossing point named then the whole moved together by the road thence to brentville and beyond to the railroad just south of its crossing of broad run a strong detachment of cavalry having gone rapidly ahead to destroy the railroad bridges south and north of the point if the crossing of the ococquin by 
those from above be resisted those landing from the potomac below to take the resisting force of the enemy in rear or if the landing from the potomac be resisted those crossing the okonquin from above to take that resisting force in rear both points will probably not be successfully resisted at the same time the force in front of centreville if pressed too hardly should fight back slowly into the entrenchments behind them armed vessels and transportation should remain at the potomac landing to cover a possible retreat general mcclellan returned the memorandum with this reply i enclose the paper you left with me filled as you requested in arriving at the numbers given i have left the minimum number in garrison and observation information received recently leads me to believe that the enemy could meet us in front with equal forces nearly and i have now my mind actively turned towards another plan of campaign that i do not think at all anticipated by the enemy nor by many of our own people the general's information was as usual erroneous johnston reports his effective total at this time as about forty seven thousand men less than one-third what mcclellan imagined it lincoln however did not insist upon knowing what the general's other plan was nor did he press further upon his attention the suggestion that had been so scantily considered and so curtly dismissed but as the weeks went by in inaction his thoughts naturally dwelt upon the opportunities afforded by an attack on the enemy's right and the project took more and more definite shape in his mind congress convened on the second of december and one of its earliest subjects of discussion was the battle of ball's bluff roscoe conkling in the house of representatives and zachariah chandler in the senate brought forward resolutions for the appointment of committees to investigate and determine the responsibility for that disaster but on motion of grimes of iowa the senate chose to order a permanent joint committee of three senators and four representatives to inquire into the conduct of the war this action was unanimously agreed to by the house and the committee was appointed consisting of senators b f wade chandler and andrew johnson and of representatives gooch cavode julian and odell this committee known as the committee on the conduct of the war was for four years one of the most important agencies in the country it assumed and was sustained by congress in assuming a great range of prerogative it became a stern and zealous censor of both the army and the government it called soldiers and statesmen before it and questioned them like refractory schoolboys it claimed to speak for the loyal people of the united states and this claim generally met with the sympathy and support of a majority of the people's representatives in congress assembled it was often hasty and unjust in its judgments but always earnest patriotic and honest it was assailed with furious denunciation and defended with headlong and indiscriminating eulogy and on the whole it must be said to have merited more praise than blame even before this committee was appointed as we have seen senators chandler and wade representing the more ardent and eager spirits in congress had repeatedly pressed upon the government the necessity of employing the army of the potomac in active operations and now that they felt themselves formally entrusted with a mandate from the people to that effect were still more urgent and persistent general mcclellan and his immediate following treated the committee with something like contempt but the president with his larger comprehension of popular forces knew that he must take into account an agency of such importance and though he steadily defended general mcclellan and his deliberateness of preparation before the committee he constantly assured him in private that not a moment ought to be lost in getting himself in readiness for a forward movement 
a free people accustomed to considering public affairs as their own can stand reverses and disappointments they are capable of making great exertions and great sacrifices the one thing that they cannot endure is inaction on the part of their rulers the one thing that they insist upon is to see some result of their exertions and sacrifices december was the fifth month that general mcclellan had been in command of the greatest army ever brought together on this continent it was impossible to convince the country that a longer period of preparation was necessary before this army could be led against one inferior in numbers and not superior in discipline or equipment as a matter of fact the country did not believe the rebel army to be equal to the army of the union in any of these particulars it did not share the delusion of general mcclellan and his staff in regard to the numbers of his adversary and the common sense of the people was nearer right in its judgment than the computations of the general and his inefficient secret service mcclellan reported to the secretary of war that johnston's army at the end of october numbered one hundred and fifty thousand and that he would therefore require to make an advance movement with the army of the potomac a force of two hundred and forty thousand johnston's report of that date shows an effective total of forty one thousand men it was useless to try to convince general mcclellan of the impossibility of such a concentration of troops in front of him he simply added together the aggregates furnished by the guesses of his spies and implicitly believed the monstrous sum it is worthy of notice that the confederate general rarely fell into the corresponding error at the time that mcclellan was quadrupling in his imagination the rebel force johnston was estimating the army under mcclellan at exactly its real strength aware that his army was less than one-third as strong as the union forces johnston contented himself with neutralizing the army at washington passing the time in drilling and disciplining his troops who according to his own account were seriously in need of it he could not account for the inactivity of the union army military operations he says were practicable until the end of december but he was never molested our military exercises had never been interrupted no demonstrations were made by the troops of that army except the occasional driving in of a confederate cavalry picket by a large mixed force the federal cavalry rarely ventured beyond the protection of infantry and the ground between the two armies had been less free to it than to that of the confederate army there was at no time any serious thought of attacking the union forces in front of washington in the latter part of september september thirty general johnston had thought it possible for the richmond government to give him such additional troops as to enable him to take the offensive and jefferson davis had come to headquarters at fairfax court house to confer with the leading commanders on that subject at this conference held on the first of october it was taken for granted that no attack could be made with any chance of success upon the union army in its position before washington but it was thought that if enough force could be concentrated for the purpose the potomac might be crossed at the nearest ford maryland brought into rebellion and a battle delivered in the rear of washington where mcclellan would fight at a disadvantage mr davis asked the three generals present johnston beauregard and g w smith beginning with the last how many troops would be required for such a movement smith answered fifty thousand johnston and beauregard both said sixty thousand and all agreed that they would require a large increase of ammunition and means of transportation mr davis said it was impossible to reinforce them to that extent and the plan was dropped it is hard to believe that during this same month of october general mcclellan in a careful letter to the war department 
with an army according to his own account of one hundred and forty seven thousand six hundred and ninety five present for duty should have bewailed his numerical inferiority to the enemy and begged that all other departments should be stripped of their troops and stores to enable him to make a forward movement which he professed himself anxious to make not later than the twenty fifth of november if the government would give him men enough to meet the enemy on equal terms this singular infatuation difficult to understand in a man of high intelligence and physically brave as mcclellan undoubtedly was must not be lost sight of it furnishes the sole explanation of many things otherwise inexplicable he rarely estimated the force immediately opposed to him at less than double its actual strength and in his correspondence with the government he persistently minimized his own force this rule he applied only to the enemy in his immediate vicinity he had no sympathy with commanders at a distance who asked for reinforcements when rosecrans succeeded him in western virginia and wanted additional troops general mcclellan was shocked at the unreasonable request when buell informed him that w t sherman insisted that two hundred thousand men were needed in the west he handed the letter to mr lincoln who was sitting in his headquarters at the moment with the remark the man is crazy every man sent to any other department he regarded as a sort of robbery of the army of the potomac all his demands were complied with to the full extent of the power of the government not only in a material but in a moral sense as well the president gave him everything that he could in addition to that mighty army he gave him his fullest confidence and support all through the autumn he stood by him urging him in private to lose no time but defending him in public against the popular impatience and when winter came on and the voice of congress nearly unanimous in demanding active operations added its authoritative tones to the clamor of the country the president endangered his own popularity by insisting that the general should be allowed to take his time for an advance in the latter part of december mcclellan as already stated fell seriously ill and the enforced paralysis of the army that resulted from this illness and lasted several weeks added a keener edge to the public anxiety the president painfully appreciated how much of justice there was in the general criticism which he was doing all that he could to allay he gave himself night and day to the study of the military situation he read a large number of strategical works he pored over the reports from the various departments and districts of the field of war he held long conferences with eminent generals and admirals and astonished them by the extent of his special knowledge and the keen intelligence of his questions he at last convinced himself that there was no necessity for any further delay that the army of the potomac was as nearly ready as it ever would be to take the field against the enemy and feeling that he could not wait any longer on the tenth of january after calling at general mcclellan's house and learning that the general was unable to see him he sent for generals mcdowell and franklin wishing to take counsel with them in regard to the possibility of beginning active operations with the army before washington general mcdowell has preserved an accurate report of this conference the president said that he was in great distress to use his own expression if something were not soon done the bottom would be out of the whole affair and if general mcclellan did not want to use the army he would like to borrow it provided he could see how it could be made to do something in answer to a direct question put by the president to general mcdowell that accomplished soldier gave a frank and straightforward expression of his conviction that by an 
energetic movement upon both flanks of the enemy a movement rendered entirely practicable by the superior numbers of the union army he could be forced from his works and compelled to accept battle on terms favorable to us general franklin rather favored an attack upon richmond by way of york river a question arising as to the possibility of obtaining the necessary transportation the president directed both generals to return the next evening and in the meantime to inform themselves thoroughly as to the matter in question they spent the following day in this duty and went the next evening to the executive mansion with what information they had been able to procure and submitted a paper in which they both agreed that in view of the time and means required to take the army to a distant base operations could now best be undertaken from the present base substantially as proposed by mcdowell the secretaries of state and of the treasury who were present coincided in this view and the postmaster-general mr blair alone opposed it they separated to meet the next day at three o'clock general meigs having been called into conference concurred in the opinion that a movement from the present base was preferable but no definite resolution was taken as general mcclellan was reported as fully recovered from his illness and another meeting was arranged for monday the thirteenth at the white house where the three members of the cabinet already mentioned with mcdowell franklin meigs and general mcclellan himself were present at the request of the president mcdowell made a statement of what he and franklin had done under mr lincoln's orders and gave his reasons for advising a movement to the front he spoke with great courtesy and deference towards his superior officer and made an apology for the position in which he stood mcclellan was not inclined to relieve the situation of any awkwardness there might be in it he merely said coldly if not curtly to mcdowell you are entitled to have any opinion you please and made no further remark or comment the president spoke somewhat at length on the matter and general mcclellan said very briefly that the case was so clear a blind man could see it and went off instinctively upon the inadequacy of his forces the secretary of the treasury whose sympathies were with that section of his party which had already lost all confidence in general mcclellan asked him point-blank what he intended to do with the army and when he intended doing it a long silence ensued even if the question had been a proper one it is doubtful whether general mcclellan would have answered it under the circumstances it must have required some self-control for him to have contented himself with merely evading it he said that buell in kentucky must move first and then refuse to answer the question unless ordered to do so the president asked him if he counted upon any particular time not asking what the time was but had he in his own mind any particular time fixed when a movement could be begun this question was evidently put as affording a means of closing a conference which was becoming disagreeable if not dangerous mcclellan promptly answered in the affirmative and the president rejoined then i will adjourn this meeting it is a remarkable fact that although the plan recommended by these generals was exactly the plan suggested six weeks before by the president to mcclellan neither of them made the slightest reference to that incident that mr lincoln did not refer to a matter so close to his heart is a striking instance of his reticence and his magnanimity that general mcclellan never mentioned it would seem to show that he thought so little of the matter as to have forgotten it he seemed also to have thought little of this conference he makes no reference to it in his report he says referring to this period about the middle of january eighteen sixty two upon recovering from a severe illness i found that excessive anxiety for an immediate movement of the army of the potomac had taken possession of the minds of the administration 
the last words of the phrase refer not only to the president but to mr stanton the new secretary of war who began as soon as he took charge of his department to ply the commander of the army with continual incitements to activity all suggestions of this sort whether coming from the government congress or the press general mcclellan received with surprise and displeasure and the resentment and vexation of his immediate friends and associates found vent in expressions of contempt for unmilitary critics which being reported only increased the evil that provoked them he at last laid before the president his plan for attacking richmond by the lower chesapeake which the president disapproved having previously convinced himself of the superior merit of the plan for a direct movement agreed upon by generals mcdowell franklin and meigs who were ignorant of the fact that it was his further delay ensued the president not being willing to accept a plan condemned by his own judgment and by the best professional opinion that he could obtain and general mcclellan being equally reluctant to adopt a plan that was not his own the president at last at the end of his patience convinced that nothing would be done unless he intervened by a positive command issued on the twenty seventh of january his general war order number one he wrote it without consultation with any one and read it to the cabinet not for their sanction but for their information the order directed that the twenty second day of february eighteen sixty two be the day for a general movement of the land and naval forces of the united states against the insurgent forces that especially the army at and about fortress monroe the army of the potomac the army of western virginia the army near mumfordville kentucky the army and flotilla at cairo and a naval force in the gulf of mexico be ready to move on that day that all other forces both land and naval with their respective commanders obey existing orders for the time and be ready to obey additional orders when duly given that the heads of departments and especially the secretaries of war and of the navy with all their subordinates and the general-in-chief with all other commanders and subordinates of land and naval forces will severally be held to their strict and full responsibilities for prompt execution of this order four days later as a necessary result of this general summons to action a special instruction called president's special war order number no. one was issued to general mcclellan commanding that all the disposable force of the army of the potomac after providing safely for the defense of washington be formed into an expedition for the immediate object of seizing and occupying a point upon the railroad southwestward of what is known as manassas junction all details to be in the discretion of the commander-in-chief and the expedition to move before or on the twenty-second day of february next this is the president's suggestion of december one put at last in the form of a command it would not have been characteristic of general mcclellan to accept such an order as final nor of mr lincoln to refuse to listen to his objections and to a full statement of his own views the president even went so far as to give him in the following note dated february three a schedule of points on which he might base his objections and develop his views my dear sir you and i have distinct and different plans for a movement of the army of the potomac yours to be down the chesapeake up the rappahannock to urbana and across land to the terminus of the railroad on the york river mine to move directly to a point on the railroad southwest of manassas if you will give me satisfactory answers to the following questions i shall gladly yield my plan to yours first does not your plan involve a greatly larger expenditure of time and money than mine second wherein is a victory more certain by your plan than mine third wherein is a victory more valuable by your plan than mine fourth 
in fact would it not be less valuable in this that it would break no great line of the enemy's communications while mine would fifth in case of disaster would not a retreat be more difficult by your plan than mine this elicited from general mcclellan a long letter dated the same day in which he dwelt with great emphasis on all the possible objections that could lie against a direct movement from washington and insisted with equal energy upon the advantages of a campaign by the lower chesapeake he rejects without argument the suggestion of an attack on both flanks of the enemy on the ground of insufficient force a ground that we have seen to be visionary he says that an attack on the left flank of the enemy is impracticable on account of the length of the line and confines his statement to a detail of the dangers and difficulties of an attack on the confederate right by the line of the Okokwan he insists that he will be met at every point by a determined resistance to use his own words he brings out in bold relief the great advantage possessed by the enemy in the strong central position he occupies with roads diverging in every direction and a strong line of defence enabling him to remain on the defensive with a small force on one flank while he concentrates everything on the other for a decisive action even if he succeeded in such a movement he thought little of its results they would be merely the possession of the field of battle the evacuation of the line of the upper potomac by the enemy and the moral effect of the victory they would not end the war the result he seemed to propose to himself in the one decisive battle he expected to fight somewhere turning to his own plan he hoped by moving from his new base on the lower chesapeake to accomplish this enormous and final success to force the enemy either to beat us in a position selected by ourselves disperse or pass beneath the caudine forks the point which he thought promised the most brilliant results was urbana on the lower rappahannock but one march from west point on the york river at the junction of the pamunkey and mattapony the key of that region and thence but two marches to richmond he enjoys the prospect of brilliant and rapid movements by which the rebel armies shall be cut off in detail richmond taken and the rebellion brought to a close he says finally my judgment as a general is clearly in favor of this project so much am i in favor of the southern line of operation that i would prefer the move from fortress monroe as a base as a certain though less brilliant movement than that from urbana to an attack upon manassas most of the assumptions upon which this letter was based have since proved erroneous the force which mcclellan ascribed to johnston existed only in his imagination and in the wild stories of his spies his force was about three times that of johnston and was therefore not insufficient for an attack upon one flank of the enemy while the other was held in check it is now clearly known that the determined resistance that he counted upon if he should attack by the line of the okokwan would not have been made general johnston says that about the middle of february he was sent for in great haste to richmond and on arriving there was told by jefferson davis that the government thought of withdrawing the army to a less exposed position johnston replied that the withdrawal of the army from centreville would be necessary before mcclellan's invasion which was to be looked for as soon as the roads were practicable but thought that it might be postponed for the present he left richmond however with the understanding on his part that the army was to fall back as soon as practicable and the moment he returned to his camp he began his preparations to retire at once from a position which both he and the richmond government considered absolutely untenable 
on the twenty second of february johnston says orders were given to the chiefs of the quartermasters and subsistence departments to remove the military property in the depots at manassas junction and its dependencies to gordonsville as quickly as possible the railroads were urged to work to their utmost capacity the line of the Oconquan, against which mcclellan was arguing so strenuously to the president was substantially the route by which johnston expected him believing like the thorough soldier that he was that it would be taken because invasion by that route would be the most difficult to meet and knowing that he could not cope with the federal army north of the rappahannock he was ready to retire behind that stream at the first news of mcclellan's advance everything now indicates that if mcclellan had chosen to obey the president's order and to move upon the enemy in his front in the latter part of february or the first days of march one of the cheapest victories ever gained by a fortunate general awaited him he would have struck an enemy greatly inferior in strength equipment and discipline in the midst of a difficult retreat already begun encumbered by a vast accumulation of provisions and stores which would have become the prize of the victor he would not have won the battle that was to end the war that sole battle was a dream of youth and ambition the war was not of a size to be finished by one fight but he would have gained at slight cost what would have been in reality a substantial success and would have appeared in its effect upon public opinion and the morale of the army an achievement of great importance the enemy instead of quietly retiring at his own time would have seemed to be driven beyond the rapidan the clearing the potomac of hostile camps and batteries above and below washington and the capture of millions of pounds of stores would have afforded a relief to the anxious public mind that the national cause sorely needed at that time and which general mcclellan needed most of all these facts that are now so clear to every one were not so evident then and although the president and the leading men in the government and in congress were strongly of the opinion that the plan favored by mr lincoln and approved by mcdowell meigs and franklin was the right one it was a question of the utmost gravity whether he should force the general-in-chief to adopt it against his obstinate protest it would be too much to ask that any government should assume such a responsibility and risk on the other hand the removal of the general from the command of the army of the potomac would have been a measure not less serious there was no successor ready who was his equal in accomplishments in executive efficiency or in popularity among the soldiers besides this and in spite of his exasperating slowness the president still entertained for him a strong feeling of personal regard he therefore after much deliberation and deep distress of mind yielded his convictions gave up his plan and adopted that of general mcclellan for a movement by the lower chesapeake he never took a resolution which cost him more in his own feelings and in the estimation of his supporters in congress and in the country at large he made no explanation of the reasons that induced this resolution he thought it better to suffer any misrepresentation rather than to communicate his own grave misgivings to the country the committee on the conduct of the war who were profoundly grieved and displeased by this decision made only this grim reference to it your committee have no evidence either oral or documentary of the discussions that ensued or of the arguments that were submitted to the consideration of the president that led him to relinquish his own line of operations and consent to the one proposed by general mcclellan except the result of a council of war held in february eighteen sixty two this council which the committee say was the first ever called by mcclellan and then only at the direction of the president was composed of twelve general officers mcdowell sumner heitzelman bernard keyes fitzjohn porter franklin w f smith mccall blenker andrew porter and 
Nagley of Hooker's division. The first four voted against the Urbana plan. Keyes only favored it on condition that the Potomac batteries should first be reduced. The rest voted for it without conditions. This was the council afterwards referred to by Stanton when he said, We saw ten generals afraid to fight this plan of campaign having been definitely adopted mr lincoln urged it forward as eagerly as if it had been his own john tucker one of the assistant secretaries of war was charged by the president and mr stanton with the entire task of transporting the army of the potomac to its new base and the utmost diligence was enjoined upon him quartermasters rufus ingalls and henry c hodges were assigned to assist him we shall see that tucker performed the prodigious task entrusted to him in a manner not excelled by any similar feat in the annals of the world but meanwhile there were two things that the president was anxious to have done and general mcclellan undertook them one was to reopen the line of the baltimore and ohio railroad the other to clear out the rebel batteries that still obstructed the navigation of the potomac for the first extensive preparations were made a large body of troops was collected at harper's ferry canal boats were brought there in sufficient quantity to make a permanent bridge general mcclellan went to the place and finding everything satisfactory for the operation telegraphed for a large additional force of cavalry artillery and a division of infantry to rendezvous at once at harper's ferry to cross as soon as the bridge was completed which would be only the work of a day and then to push on to winchester and strasburg it was only on the morning of the next day when the attempt was made to pass the canal boats through the lift lock that it was discovered they were some six inches too wide to go through the general thus found that his permanent bridge so long planned and from which so much had been expected was impossible he countermanded his order for the troops contented himself with a reconnaissance to charlestown and martinsburg and returned to washington as he says well satisfied with what had been accomplished he was much surprised at finding that his satisfaction was not shared by the president mr lincoln's slow anger was thoroughly roused by this ridiculous outcome of an important enterprise and he received the general on his return in a manner that somewhat disturbed his complacency mcclellan went on in his leisurely way preparing for a movement upon the batteries near the oconquin undisturbed by the increasing signs of electric perturbation at the executive mansion and the capitol which answered but faintly to the growing excitement in the north the accumulating hostility and distrust of general mcclellan totally unjust as it affected his loyalty and honor and his ardent desire to serve his country in the way that he thought best though almost entirely unknown to him was poured upon the president the heads of government and the leading members of congress in letters and conversations and newspaper leaders mr lincoln felt the injustice of much of this criticism but he also felt powerless to meet it unless some measures were adopted to force the general into an activity which was as necessary to his own reputation as to the national cause the twenty second of february came and passed and the president's order to move on that day was not obeyed mcclellan's inertia prevailed over the president's anxious eagerness on the eighth of march mr lincoln issued two more important general orders the first directed general mcclellan to divide the army of the potomac into four army corps to be commanded respectively by generals irvin mcdowell e v sumner s p heitzelman and e d keyes the forces to be left in front of washington were to be placed in command of general james s wadsworth a fifth corps was to be formed to be commanded by general n p banks for months this measure had been pressed upon general mcclellan by the government 
an army of a hundred and fifty thousand men it was admitted could not be adequately commanded by the machinery of divisions and brigades alone but though mcclellan accepted this view in principle he could not be brought to put it into practice he said that he would prefer to command the army personally on its first campaign and then select the corps commanders for their behavior in the field the government thought better to make the organization at once giving the command of corps to the ranking division commanders the fact that of the four generals chosen three had been in favor of an immediate movement against the enemy in front of washington will of course be considered as possessing a certain significance it was usually regarded as a grievance by the partisans of general mcclellan the other order is of such importance that we give it entire president's general war order number three executive mansion washington march eight eighteen sixty two ordered that no change of the base of operations of the army of the potomac shall be made without leaving in and about washington such a force as in the opinion of the general-in-chief and the commanders of army corps shall leave said city entirely secure that no more than two army corps about fifty thousand troops of said army of the potomac shall be moved en route for a new base of operations until the navigation of the potomac from washington to the chesapeake bay shall be freed from enemies batteries and other obstructions or until the president shall hereafter give express permission that any movement as aforesaid en route for a new base of operations which may be ordered by the general-in-chief and which may be intended to move upon the chesapeake bay shall begin to move upon the bay as early as the eighteenth of march instant and the general-in-chief shall be responsible that it moves as early as that day ordered that the army and navy cooperate in an immediate effort to capture the enemy's batteries upon the potomac between washington and the chesapeake bay abraham lincoln l thomas adjutant general this order has always been subject to the severest criticism from general mcclellan's partisans but if we admit that it was proper for the president to issue any order at all there can be no valid objection made to the substance of this one it was indispensable that washington should be left secure it would have been madness to allow general mcclellan to take all the troops to the peninsula leaving the potomac obstructed by the enemy's batteries so near the capital and the fixing of a date beyond which the beginning of the movement should not be postponed had been shown to be necessary by the exasperating experience of the past eight months the criticism so often made that a general who required to have such orders as these given him should have been dismissed the service is the most difficult of all to meet nobody felt so deeply as mr lincoln the terrible embarrassment of having a general in command of that magnificent army who was absolutely without initiative who answered every suggestion of advance with demands for reinforcements who met entreaties and reproaches with unending arguments to show the superiority of the enemy and the insufficiency of his own resources and who yet possessed in an eminent degree the enthusiastic devotion of his friends and the general confidence of the rank and file there was so much of executive efficiency and ability about him that the president kept on hoping to the last that if he could once get him started he would then handle the army well and do great things with it End of chapter nine chapter ten of abraham lincoln a history volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay manassas evacuated sunday the ninth of march was a day of swiftly succeeding emotions at the executive mansion the news of the havoc wrought by the merrimac in hampton roads the day before arrived in the morning and was received with profound chagrin by the calmest spirits and with something like consternation by the more excitable but in the afternoon 
astonishing tidings came to reverse the morning's depression the first was of the timely arrival of the monitor followed shortly on the completion of the telegraph to fort monroe by the news of her battle and victory the exultation of the government over this providential success was changed to amazement by the receipt of intelligence that the rebel batteries on the potomac were already abandoned and the tale of surprises was completed by the news which came in the evening that the confederate army had abandoned their works at manassas retreating southward general mcclellan was with the president and the secretary of war when this message arrived and he received it as might have been expected with incredulity which at last gave way to stupefaction he started at once across the river ostensibly to verify the intelligence and issued an order that night for an immediate advance of the army upon centreville and manassas in the elaborate report by which he strove a year after the fact to shift from himself the responsibility of all errors occurs this remarkable sentence the retirement of the enemy towards richmond had been expected as the natural consequence of the movement to the peninsula but their adoption of this course immediately on ascertaining that such a movement was intended while it relieved me from the results of the undue anxiety of my superiors and attested the character of the design was unfortunate in that the then almost impassable roads between our positions and theirs deprived us of the opportunity for inflicting damage usually afforded by the withdrawal of a large army in the face of a powerful adversary this was the theory immediately adopted by himself propagated among his staff communicated to the prince de joinville who published it in france on his return there and to the comte de paris who after twenty years incorporated it in his history that the enemy having heard of his scheme for going to the peninsula through the indiscretion of the government had suddenly taken flight from manassas general mcclellan asserts this in his report a dozen times he reiterates it as if he felt that his reputation depended upon it if it is not true then in the long contest with the president in regard to a direct attack from washington the president was right and mcclellan was wrong the straightforward narrative of general johnston and the official orders and correspondence of the confederate officers show that there is not the slightest foundation for this theory of general mcclellan's they show on the contrary that the rebel government nearly a month before this had concluded that johnston's position was untenable that johnston had shared in the belief and had begun his preparations to retire on the twenty second of february that instead of ascertaining mcclellan's intention to move to the lower chesapeake he had been of the opinion that mcclellan would advance upon the line designated by mr lincoln because it was the best line for attack and the most difficult for the rebels to defend that he knew mcclellan's enormous superiority in numbers and did not propose to risk everything in resisting him there that on the fifth of march having received information of unusual activity in our army in the direction of dumfries he gave his final orders and on the seventh began to move he proceeded with the greatest deliberation writing to one of his generals on the fifteenth mcclellan seems not to value time especially his subordinates were equally convinced that the confederate right was the object of the union advance holmes wrote in that sense to robert e lee on the fifteenth of march lee who was then directing military operations in richmond answered him on the sixteenth concurring in this view recognizing the advantages of such a plan and saying that he will advance upon our line as soon as he can i have no doubt until the eighteenth of march johnston did not suspect that mcclellan was not advancing to strike his right flank he then fell back behind the rapidan to guard against other contingencies even while our vast army was passing down the potomac he could not make out where it was going 
so late as the early days of april jefferson davis was in doubt as to mcclellan's destination and johnston only heard of the advance upon yorktown about the fifth of that month by the very test therefore to which general mcclellan appeals in the paragraph quoted above his conduct during the autumn and winter stands finally condemned by their contemporaneous letters and orders by their military movements in an important crisis by their well-considered historical narratives the confederate government and generals have established these facts beyond all possibility of future refutation that the plan for a direct attack suggested by lincoln and rejected by mcclellan was a sound and practicable one it was the plan they expected and dreaded to see adopted because it was the one easiest to accomplish and hardest to resist when they fancied that they saw the army of the potomac preparing to move it was this plan alone of which they thought and they immediately gave up their position as they had been for weeks preparing to do at the first intimation of a forward movement the long delay of five months during three of which the roads were in unusually fine condition during all of which the union forces were as three to one of the enemy remains absolutely without excuse it can only be explained by that idiosyncrasy of general mcclellan which led him always to double or treble the number of an enemy and the obstacles in his immediate vicinity it is little blame to confederate generals that they could not divine what general mcclellan was doing with the grand army of the union during the week that followed the evacuation of manassas no soldier could have been expected to guess the meaning of that promenade of a vast army to centreville and manassas and back to alexandria in spite of the impassable roads they made the journey with ease and celerity the question why the whole army was taken has never been satisfactorily answered general mcclellan's explanation afterwards was that he wanted the troops to have a little experience of marching and to get rid of their impedimenta he claims in his report to have found on this excursion a full justification of his extravagant estimate of the enemy's force and speaks with indignation of the calumnious stories of quaker guns which were rife in the press at the time every one now knows how fatally false the estimate was and as to the quaker guns this is what general johnston says about them as we had not artillery enough for their works and for the army fighting elsewhere at the same time rough wooden imitations of guns were made and kept near the embrasures in readiness for exhibition in them to conceal the absence of carriages the embrasures were covered with sheds made of bushes these were the quaker guns afterwards noticed in northern papers without further discussing where the fault lay the fact is beyond dispute that when the evacuation of manassas was known throughout the country the military reputation of general mcclellan received serious damage no explanation made at the time and we may add none made since then could account satisfactorily for such a mistake as to the condition of the enemy such utter ignorance as to his movements the first result of it was the removal of general mcclellan from the command of the armies of the united states this resolution was taken by the president himself on the eleventh of march on that day he prepared the order known as president's war order number no. three and in the evening called together mr seward mr chase and mr stanton and read it to them it was in these words president's war order number no. three executive mansion washington march eleventh eighteen sixty two major general mcclellan having personally taken the field at the head of the army of the potomac until otherwise ordered he is relieved from the command of the other military departments he retaining command of the department of the potomac ordered further that the departments now under the respective commands of generals halleck and hunter together with so much of that under general buell as lies west of a north and south line indefinitely drawn through knoxville tennessee be consolidated and designated the department of the mississippi and that until otherwise ordered major general halleck have command of said department 
ordered also that the country west of the department of the potomac and east of the department of the mississippi be a military department to be called the mountain department and that the same be commanded by major-general fremont that all the commanders of departments after the receipt of this order by them respectively report severally and directly to the secretary of war and that prompt full and frequent reports will be expected of all and each of them abraham lincoln all the members of the cabinet present heartily approved the order the president gave his reason for issuing it while general mcclellan was absent from washington a reason indeed apparent in the opening words which were intended to take from the act any appearance of disfavor the general's intimate biographers have agreed that it was because the president was afraid to do it while the general was in washington the manner of the order which was meant as a kindness was taken as a grievance mr seward advised that the order be issued in the name of the secretary of war but this proposition met with a decided protest from mr stanton he said there was some friction already between himself and the general's friends and he feared that the act if signed by him would be attributed to personal feeling the president decided to take the responsibility in a manly and courteous letter the next day mcclellan accepted the disposition thus made of him on the thirteenth of march at fairfax court house general mcclellan called together the four corps commanders who were with him and submitted to them for discussion the president's order of the eighth the results of the council cannot be more briefly stated than in the following memorandum drawn up by the generals who took part in it a council of the generals commanding army corps at the headquarters of the army of the potomac were of the opinion one that the enemy having retreated from manassas to gordonsville behind the rappahannock and rapidan it is the opinion of the generals commanding army corps that the operations to be carried on will be best undertaken from old point comfort between the york and james rivers provided first that the enemy's vessel merrimac can be neutralized second that the means of transportation sufficient for an immediate transfer of the force to its new base can be ready at washington and alexandria to move down the potomac and third that a naval auxiliary force can be had to silence or aid in silencing the enemy's batteries on the york river fourth that the force to be left to cover washington shall be such as to give an entire feeling of security for its safety from menace unanimous two if the foregoing cannot be the army should then be moved against the enemy behind the rappahannock at the earliest possible moment and the means for reconstructing bridges repairing railroads and stocking them with materials sufficient for supplying the army should at once be collected for both the orange and alexandria and aquia and richmond railroads unanimous n b that with the forts on the right bank of the potomac fully garrisoned and those on the left bank occupied a covering force in front of the virginia line of twenty five thousand men would suffice keyes heinzelman and mcdowell a total of forty thousand men for the defence of the city would suffice sumner these conclusions of the council were conveyed to washington and the president on the same day sent back to general mcclellan his approval and his peremptory orders for the instant execution of the plan proposed in these words signed by the secretary of war president having considered the plan of operations agreed upon by yourself and the commanders of army corps makes no objection to the same but gives the following directions as to its execution first leave such force at manassas junction as shall make it entirely certain that the enemy shall not repossess himself of that position and line of communication second leave washington entirely secure third move the remainder of the force down the potomac choosing a new base at fort monroe or anywhere between here and there or at all events move such remainder of the army at once in pursuit of the enemy by some route no commander could ask an order more unrestricted more unhampered than this choose your own route your own course only go seek the enemy and fight him 
under the orders of john tucker of the war department a fleet of transports had been preparing since the twenty seventh of february it is one of the many grievances mentioned by general mcclellan in his report that this work was taken entirely out of his hands and committed to those of mr tucker he thus stops himself from claiming any credit for one of the most brilliant feats of logistics ever recorded on the twenty seventh of february mr tucker received his orders on the seventeenth of march the troops began their embarkation on the fifth of april mr tucker made his final report announcing that he had transported to fort monroe from washington perryville and alexandria one hundred and twenty one thousand five hundred men fourteen thousand five hundred and ninety two animals one thousand one hundred and fifty wagons forty four batteries seventy four ambulances besides pontoon bridges telegraph materials and the enormous quantity of equipage etc required for an army of such magnitude the only loss he adds of which i have heard is eight mules and nine barges which latter went ashore in a gale within a few miles of fort monroe the cargoes being saved he is certainly justified in closing his narrative with these words i respectfully but confidently submit that for economy and celerity of movement this expedition is without a parallel on record the first corps to embark was heitzelman's he took with him from general mcclellan the most stringent orders to do nothing more than to select camping grounds send out reconnaissances engage guides and spies but to make no important move in advance the other forces embarked in turn mcdowell's corps being left to the last and before it was ready to sail general mcclellan himself started on the first of april with the headquarters on the steamer commodore leaving behind him a state of things that made it necessary to delay the departure of mcdowell's troops still further in all the orders of the president it had been clearly stated that as an absolute condition precedent to the army being taken away to a new base enough troops should be left at washington to make that city absolutely safe not only from capture but from serious menace the partisans of general mcclellan then and ever since then have contended that as washington could not be seriously attacked without exposing richmond to capture undue importance was attached to it in these orders it would be a waste of words to argue with people who place the political and strategic value of these two cities on a level the capture of richmond without the previous virtual destruction of the rebel armies would have been it is true an important achievement but the seizure of washington by the rebels would have been a fatal blow to the union cause general mcclellan was in the habit of saying that if the rebel army should take washington while he was at richmond they could never get back but it might be said that the general who would permit washington to be taken could not be relied on to prevent the enemy from doing what they liked afterwards mr lincoln was unquestionably right in insisting that washington must not only be rendered safe from capture but must also be without the possibility of serious danger this view was adopted by the council of corps commanders who met on the thirteenth of march at fairfax courthouse they agreed unanimously upon this principle and then so as to leave no doubt as to details three of the four gave the opinion that after the forts on the virginia side were fully garrisoned and those on the maryland side occupied a covering force of twenty five thousand men would be required the morning after general mcclellan had sailed for fort monroe the secretary of war was astonished to hear from general james s wadsworth the military governor of the district of washington that mcclellan had left him present for duty only nineteen thousand men and that from that force he had orders to detach eight good regiments he further reported that his command was entirely inadequate to the important duty to which it was assigned as general wadsworth was a man of the highest intelligence courage and calm judgment the president was greatly concerned by this emphatic statement orders were at once given to general e a hitchcock an accomplished veteran officer on duty at the war department and to adjutant-general lorenzo thomas to investigate the statement made by general wadsworth 
they reported the same night that it would require thirty thousand men to man and occupy the forts which with the covering force of twenty five thousand would make fifty five thousand necessary for the proper defence of the city according to the judgment of the council of corps commanders they confirmed the report of wadsworth that his efficient force consisted of nineteen thousand from which general mcclellan had ordered eight regiments away they therefore concluded that the requirement of the president that the city should be left entirely secure had not been fully complied with in accordance with this report the president directed that general mcdowell's corps should not be sent to the peninsula until further orders End of chapter 10